I will explore some of the hottest business and economic topics. The thing is, at least it's in the Philippines, because there's always going to be a conflict at some point between commercial considerations and social considerations. Well, how does the crop insurance extend to the credit as well? Whenever a bank lends to either rice or corn by law, that loan must be covered by crop insurance. Good evening and welcome once again to Eye on Business. I'm Ben Kritz. Since the very start of President Rodrigo Duterte's term, the intensive development of infrastructure has been a cornerstone of government policy and because very little can be accomplished in this country unless it has a catchy acronym or a catchy name, the administration has called it the Build, Build, Build program. And build they have a number of large projects that were started during the last administration but had not progressed and were suddenly given new life. A couple of good examples of these are the new MRT-7 line to Bulacan, uh, the Bulacan Bulk Water Project, and the Skyway that will finally connect the North and South Luzon expressways. And of course, a large number of entirely new projects were started, as well as projects that never made it off the drawing board during the Aquino administration, including some new bridges over the Pasig River, the long-awaited replacement for the Manila International Airport, which will be located in Bulacan, significant upgrades to the Philippine National Railways, and possibly a new water supply for Metro Manila if they get the Kaliwad Dam project off the ground. And there have been literally thousands of smaller projects all around the country, roads, bridges, flood control systems, drainage, um, little things that help but are not really big news. So, as the country has watched these developments over the past three years, one hears one of two things. Uh, the majority of the people are very supportive of the administration's efforts and the visible progress being made. And then there are some critics who you know, question the cost, uh, question the loans that are, that are made for these, uh, question the traffic tie-ups that all these projects cause around the big cities. And there are, are also questions about the whole program itself because there's far fewer projects that are on the list of hopeful things that will be completed now than there were in 2016 when they started. And there's been a few big setbacks. Um, for instance, the fire that took out a large portion of the still under construction Skyway Stage 3 project a little over two weeks ago. But what one does not hear anyone, either a supporter or a critic, asking whether or not the infrastructure projects that are being pursued are actually the infrastructure projects that the country needs most. <laughs> That is to say, whether the infrastructure projects they are building are the ones that most address the immediate needs and the longer term needs. They all address some needs, but are they in the right priority? From where I sit, which is right here, I suspect that many of them are not. And the reason why is because of the way the infrastructure pro program fits into the Duterte administration's agenda. The priority, as it's been explained to me several times, the priority of the government is poverty reduction. And in that sense, embarking on a massive infrastructure drive is a tool to reduce poverty. And it's easy to see why that would happen. It generates jobs, generates economic activity. And the rising tide lifts all boats. But it's not infrastructure for infrastructure's sake, but infrastructure as a means to combat a larger problem. And therefore, none of what's being done is necessarily bad, but it may not necessarily be right either. Of course, when one has a deep question of that nature, a question of how things in a complex system should work together, 
the best thing to do is to consult an expert. And I'm very lucky this evening to have one of the best known experts on architecture and urban design, uh, certainly in this country and throughout the world, actually. And he's a fellow columnist of mine here at the Manila Times. Um, please welcome Felino Palafox. And can I call you June? I know everybody calls you June. Yeah, thank you, Ben, for having me here. Thank you. And the opportunity to share. Well, the first question is, just in general, what are your thoughts about the government's infrastructure drive? It's, uh, it's admirable in the sense that uh, it's more to use with infrastructure. And as you said, the overarching goal is poverty alleviation and, and job creation, which is good. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the build, build, build. We just completed the urban master plan for Metro Davao, and the theme is build better, verde. So build better and sustainable. And, and most of the projects now are uh, cuts up situations of planning initiatives four decades ago and mm -hmm. longer. Like for instance, the, the LRT. When I was senior planner, team leader for development planning of the World Bank funded Metro Manila Transport Land Use Development Project, we have identified and proposed eight LRT lines to be completed by 1992. Mm -hmm. Up to now, only three LRT lines. And the American Corps of Engineers, in 1945, they proposed six circumferential roads in Metro Manila. Only now, six circumferential road number six is being built. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also the subway system, it was put forward in 1971. It's only now being started. I think 80% of the eight infrastructure we need by 2050 is still to be built mm -hmm. and planned for. And, and uh, I hope the next administration will continue these initiatives. And also, when we accept projects or we plan uh, urban development projects, even architecture, our guideline is the triple bottom line ap approach to development. People first, or social equity, then planet Earth or the environment. Then we can talk about prosperity and profit, and maybe include culture, history, and heritage, and interfaith uh, spirituality. These have been our guiding principles, and and I hope it will be, become part of the guiding principles in prioritizing, pro, prioritizing projects. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this. Um, they're catching up to a, a lot of things that mm -hmm. should have been done years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the big projects, as I mentioned, some of the big projects that are going on right now mm -hmm. are things that were intended to have been started in the previous six year period, and they're just now getting to them. Are, are the plans and the, the grand designs of 40 years ago still valid today? Um, you know, are, are, the, are, are is what some of they're doing, some of what they're doing now actually even a little bit, you know, behind what, you know, the, the country and particularly Metro Manila really needs? Yeah, it's been, and, and like about 40 years ago in the, Metro Plan Manila, we said that time, with a do-nothing scenario, we will have catastrophic traffic, flooding, lack of decent housing. We're building on the wrong places, mm -hmm. areas that are liable to flooding, and big infrastructure for water supply. We said then, 1976, 77, we need other sources of water supply in 15 years from 1977. It's only now that uh, it's being addressed. And flooding, uh, there was a project, Paranaque Spillway, because during the floods, uh, 4,000 plus cubic meters of floodwaters of the mountains, they flow into Laguna Lake. Right. And the only one that flows out to Vanilla Bay is uh, uh, Pasig River, which can accommodate only 600 cubic meters per, per second. Mm -hmm. So the f 
4,000 cubic meters floods about 80% of Metro Manila. All of these were identified before. And I think until the 70s, there was being established uh, a planning system, not just uh, for continuity, addressing immediate action, short-term, medium-term, and long-term programs and projects. Right. But uh, now it's roadmaps and blueprints. Mm -hmm. Not a comprehensive planning system right. for Road continuity. and blueprints in separate areas. Yes, yes. Yeah. So the Department of Transportation has a roadmap. Yeah. You know, the the very does. sectoral, instead right. of multidisciplinary, integrated, mm -hmm. holistic. Right. Mm -hmm. doesn't, that, doesn't that in a way reflect the way this city has developed? I mean, everything is in little cells around. And I know that that's something that you've... That, that you've been critical of yeah. you know all along the way that there are so many gated villages and you know yeah. isolated and cut off areas yeah you're right that our central business districts like Makati central business district most of the employees of Makati waste about five to six hours a day mm -hmm. going to and from work planning is balance you should balance between jobs and housing in Makati, uh, the employees are priced out of the housing stock, and so, uh, also in, the, in Ortega, Green Hills, surrounded by low density gated communities. Right. And even our, like EDSA corridor, EDSA is functioning like, uh, functioning like a major artery, minor artery road, major collector road, minor collector road, residential access road, shopping malls access road, Military comes access road then what have you. So Edsa Corridor with the volume of traffic now needs eight parallel roads and where are these parallel roads? Inside military camps and gated communities. Mm -hmm. I can I, I can I can you know personally have an example in my new apartment where I happen to be located. Mm -hmm. I ride the LRT two mm -hmm. to commute. Um, mm -hmm. in a straight line it would be about a five minute walk yes. to the train. I can watch the train from my apartment go by, but I have to go all the way down here and come all the way yeah. back to get to the station because there's no access across. Yeah, it's really planning is connectivity. Mm -hmm. Like, and there are 20 kinds of urban transport, but most of our infrastructure is car centric. Right. devoted for the automobile and if uh, anecdotal research tells us that only two percent of filipinos own cars mm -hmm. and all of us are pedestrians once you leave your car you're a pedestrian so we could uh, there's opportunity low-hanging fruit uh, 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 of uh, uh, making our cities more walkable and bikeable like uh, pasig river san juan river and marikina river I've been proposing pedestrian bridges every 800 meters. Mm -hmm. Because when we were planning, designing Rockwell, a survey was done. We Metro Manila, we walk only 400 meters. Okay. Elsewhere that in the world, true. even during the hot seasons, uh, July, August in Europe or the USA, I can walk 14 to 20 kilometers a day. In Makati, I walk less than two kilometers a day. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, was my, that was my next question. Um, what can be done with with the infrastructure that there is now? Now, if we if if we could take a look at your your yeah. your uh, one article here, I know you've designed. There we go. This one here. Cities of the future. Yeah, let's 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 show that here. This is this is one of the many many things you've written, but it has a very nice it has a very nice design here for how much you can actually you can actually get onto EDSA yes. if it was designed properly. Can that be done with the, in, in the, the shape that, uh, yeah. that Ed's is in now? I think it can still be done. Mm -hmm. Let's say we have elevated walkways and bicycle lanes. Because uh, road cross sections should have one third for trees and landscaping, one third for people, pedestrians and bicycles, and only one third for moving traffic lanes. Right. And it's, uh, I think, has 500,000 vehicles a day. For every car you own, for every car, you must plant 10 trees. 
to recover the oxygen out of the carbon monoxide per car. Mm -hmm. So EDSA corridors should have 5 million trees, but where can we put them? Right. Practically no sidewalks. And it's faster to walk 5 kil uh, kilometers per hour than that 3 kilometers per hour, especially during Friday, payday, and it's raining. And EDSA corridor is probably the most overmold more regional shopping centers than any uh, transport corridor elsewhere in the world. Um, and, and you know, you know a bit about the history of, of how this city developed. How did it come to pass that EDSA became such an artery for, for Manila? I think for one, the, uh, the circumferential roads and radial roads proposed by the American Corps of Engineers in 1945 has not been completed. Mm -hmm. And I have been proposing 10 circumferential roads uh, in addition uh, with the six circumferential roads to integrate together Calabarzon, Southern Metro Manila, and Central Luzon. Like it's only being done now, the proposal to connect Bataan and Cavite. Right. So if you don't have a business going to Metro Manila, you can just bypass it. Mm -hmm. Like Cavite, you go to Subic or Clark, can have a Manila Bay Bridge or a tunnel, it's doable. And also, let's go to airports. Before we became a Philippine Republic, an anecdotal uh, research tells me we had 200 airports and runways. I think today we only have about 20, and I think only a dozen are lighted, so you can have night landing. All right. Let's take a short break. Okay, and we're back with mm. architect Gene Palafox. Yeah, now, as, uh, I was, as we were talking about just during the break there, EDSA is, is really the everything road for Metro Manila. And I, I've, in, in some of my columns talking about transportation um, and infrastructure, I've kind of criticized them for focusing so much on EDSA. But as you're explaining, you kind of have no choice because everything has ended up on EDSA. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the malls are there, you know, the businesses are there, people live there, and there's transportation. How, how, can, they, how can they design things or, or come up with some new infrastructure to kind of spread things away from, yeah. from one road? Metropolitan cities are po polycentric several centers mm -hmm. and EDSA corridor which was uh, proposed in 1945 built in 1954 about 54 meters wide it's no longer a transportation corridor but more of a destination mm -hmm. so we have regional shopping malls along EDSA maybe five seven or even ten regional shopping malls elsewhere in the world should be about nine kilometers apart and EDSA corridor is only 10, 27 kilometers. Mm -hmm. And it's still really over mold. Another one is uh, individual decisions for land use, not a comprehensive view. So developers, of course, uh, their, I think profit motivation is the major uh, goals of business. But um, uh, in Individual decisions taken by landowners and developers are being approved by local governments. Mm -hmm. There's no metropolitan view. Right. And EDSA Corridor is a good example of how not to do it. Yes, exactly. There are about, I think, 13 LRT lines. Elsewhere in the world, like New York, Singapore, Hong Kong, Tokyo, uh, London, when you have uh, major transport uh, uh, hubs, it's surrounded by high density housing. Mm -hmm. So you have more people within walkable distance from the LRT stations. And what do we have around the LRT stations? 
gated low density communities that Worship. don't use the LRT and yeah. gated military camps. Yeah, or shopping malls. And shopping and malls I, as I well. The, the um, well, the, there there are no with the LRT lines that, that that they have now. There are no real good connections. Yeah. Um, and uh, they're building a common station. Yeah. Uh, up near SM North, but I don't even think that they're, is... They're not collected. They're, it's not designed well to... Yeah. Uh, I'm used to, in other cities, um, you know, uh, New York, uh, even in Philadelphia, Chicago, I remember is a good, San Francisco is a good example, too. Mm -hmm. The lines are stacked up. You, you go to one station, and if you need to go a different direction, you just go upstairs, downstairs, or maybe over here a little bit. And you know you're on the next train here. It's yeah. you know they run them as, as a couple of separate things. Um, why do you think? I know I know you've you've come up with you, you've come up with master plans for you know for the whole city. JICA has developed several over the years. And why why do you th why do you think that? You know th those those big plans don't find their way into you know actual into the roadmaps in the the blueprints that they come up with. Yeah, uh, I've been I've done projects in forty countries, mm -hmm. and the more successful cities and countries have visionary leadership, leaders with vision, a strong political will. It's I think we have under the Duterte administration, the political will. Good appreciation of urban planning, mm -hmm. good design like architecture engineering, mm -hmm. and good governance. They have long-term goals, and I think most of our projects here is short-term and opportunistic, right. not long-term and visionary. And we have that, starting to have that planning system in, in the 70s, mm -hmm. but there's no continuity. New administrations, would cancel previous planning initiatives. Right. We need transportation, power, water supply, decent housing, garbage collection, wastewater treatment plants. And in the 70s, I've been fortunate enough to get involved in United Nations Development Program aided projects, USAID, mm -hmm. JICA had another name that time. And there were so many foreign funded projects that, uh, that, uh, funded many of these urban planning initiatives and infrastructure initiatives. Government cannot do it alone. And, and I think most progressive cities in the world, 80% is done by the private sector. Right. So there's more uh, integration between individual private plans and comprehensive plans with strong urban planning. Mm -hmm. We have a very weak urban planning system in our country. Like if you go back to 1970s, there were two agencies, the infrastructure planning group of the then Department of Public Works, Transportation and Communications. So transportation, communications, and public works are more integrated, were more mm -hmm. integrated. And there was also interagency uh, group for infrastructure planning headed by the NEDA. And the universities were also much more involved. Right. And when we got the democratic space after 1986, I think all this planning had been not continued. And also there was a Department of Human Settlements, more focus on housing. It was also abolished as an agency. Now it just, they just started a new department of housing and urban development. Mm -hmm. So there, there are some, I'm hopeful still about the future. But private sector should be more involved. Like in Manhattan, in the 70s, there were what they call greedy developers. Right. But there were illustrious people who were opposing it. And, and uh, Henry Kissinger and, and um, uh, what's her name? Jacqueline Kennedy. They were opposing the, the loss of, uh, uh, of, of the open spaces, uh, overbuilding, and so on. I remember that. And today, you look at the comprehensive zoning ordinance of Metro Manila in 1979. Mm -hmm. Most of the open spaces have been sold and developed 
allowed by local governments. And let's say an open space, a park, mm -hmm. what's the traffic generation? Pedestrian traffic. Right. You put a major development, it will probably attract 2,000 cars. Right. And that's, that's, it's not cuts up. Yeah, we've seen we've seen that in we, we've seen that very recently. It's happening. Ayala Triangle, for instance. Yeah, uh, they've and cut that space. If down. you compare Metro Manila to the human body, our major activity centers like central business districts are are so congested, and our uh, uh, so the heart of the city are the major activity centers. The, uh, the arteries are the roads and waterways, and the open spaces are lungs of the city. So Metro Manila needs a heart transplant, lung transfer, and a bypass, <laughs> a heart bypass. That's pretty good. Let's mm -hmm. take another short break. <laughs> mga isyung pinag-uusapan, mga palitang laman ng pahayagan, impormasyong dapat yung malaman, tatalakayin, Pupusisiin at hihimayin ni Mario Garcia kasama ang kanyang mga panauhin sa harap ng bayan. Face Off! Uh, welcome back with June Palafox and we're discussing infrastructure and city planning and how and that's a little, bit, uh, a little bit of a challenge here in Metro Manila. Um, if we take a look at some of the projects that are going on now, um, are there any that stand out to you that are very good and and forward looking? And conversely, are there any that they're that they're working on that they probably shouldn't be working on? You know, from from your you know from your perspective. I think the good ones are uh, really the infrastructure, but again. The priority should be pedestrian, mm -hmm. not the automobile, and and uh, the lack of uh, water supply for Metro Manila is being done now, and strengthening the regions, because even the whole country, as I said, planning is balanced. There's so much imbalance, and we should create more uh, uh, the emerging metropolitan areas, make them more attractive as counter magnets to Metro Manila. In year 2000, Harvard study of the cities in the world, mm -hmm. Metro Manila was the uh, highest in migration uh, per hour. 60 persons per hour or per second. Oh my. Compared to New York, London, Paris, maybe uh, five persons per second or per hour, I don't remember now. Mm -hmm. So it was the fastest growing metropolis in the world. And infrastructure has not uh, caught up with it. Right. And, and uh, like the railway system uh, being built in Mindanao, I think that will be, it will spur development in Mindanao. Mm -hmm. But in, in right, the Visayas and also. If they don't change the rate of migration, then you'll never catch up with the infrastructure. Yeah, correct? you're right. You're right. And I've been uh, saying that uh, by 2050, we'll need 100 new cities. And, and uh, by not doing that, with a do-nothing scenario, our cities will become more congested, as bad if not worse than the situation in Metro Manila right now. And more of the, most of the uh, infrastructure projects being built now will alleviate the traffic situation, mm -hmm. but not enough to solve the traffic problem. Right. So then what, what, is the, what is the next step? Is they're only going to get so much done. So what should, what should the next administration do, you know, to, to make the most of what's being done now, as opposed to just taking the list, you know, the blueprints and the roadmaps mm -hmm. and continuing with them? I mean, how can they, how, how can they make it more sustainable? That's, a, you know, the word we, we use a lot. I think the next administration should continue the initiatives now and uh, add more uh, 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 demand and requirements for infrastructure. And let's make the whole Philippines or Metro Manila polycentric, many centers, like the airports. Mm -hmm. In 1984, we were 
consulted and hired to uh, do a master re redevelopment plan for the uh, NAIA, the International Airport of Manila, to upgrade its capacity for the demand the next 15 years mm -hmm. while waiting for Clark Airport to develop. So we lost about 15 years by not implementing that plan. And also, it may be it's a bit of a segue. I think we should open up our economy. Because even if you put together all the monies of the oligarchs or even all Filipino taxpayers, it's not enough to bring us to the first world. I see. So Foreign investment, so we need it. Yeah, that's, that's a... That's a good point. That's a, but it's always a tricky subject because mm. the constitutional you know, they're, they're, constraints, right? They're yeah. a little bit adverse to that. But even with the, you know, the, uh, that's a big, you know, that's a big talking point of the, the build, build, build program is how much they have increased the, you know, infrastructure spending either in, in, uh, you know, peso terms or as a percentage of GDP. And you're saying that that's still not enough. Not enough. And, and let's say the elevated highways. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the initiatives of the private sector and government. But these elevated uh, expressways and highways are what we describe in the American Planning Association is uh, like cheating on your diet by loosening your belt. Mm -hmm. In 15 years, they will become elevated parking lots. Yeah, well, and so we had to look at mass transit uh, uh, more, uh, more aggressively. And it has happened everywhere. Beijing, it's happening already. And uh, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. this uh, is not helping at all, uh, the mass transit and pedestrianization. So instead of number of vehicles per lane per hour you should look at more of mobility how many people per right. lane per hour instead of so many cars per lane per hour isn't that isn't that really isn't that really a consistent flaw in the thinking though and i mean this is not just this administration or the, or the last one but, but way back is they don't consider moving people you know, all the plans are, are geared to moving vehicles, you know, cars and, okay, buses, but, you know, they still, it's still vehicle-centric, not, yeah. not people-centric. Yeah. Um, building more roads alleviate the situation, but it can also worsen the situation. You add more capacity for vehicles, you will be adding more cars mm -hmm. and, 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 and so on. So it's really walkability walkable and mass transit. Even the water transport, we have put forward so many proposals already, like Laguna Lake, water transport, Pasigli River, uh, water transport, and Manila Bay. Mm -hmm. So we, you can have a, a water transportation <coughs> to alleviate traffic and uh, complement the road traffic corridors. And there's so many opportunities. Like we have proposed a long time ago, uh, promenades and, uh, and uh, pedestrian facilities in our waterfronts. Mm -hmm. Elsewhere in the world, a waterfront is prime real estate. In our part of the world, uh, the waterfront is treated as back of the house, garbage dump, and so on. Right. That's, yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, every, you know, every city with a river flowing through it, you know, yeah. that, that's... Make the most of the waterfront. Yeah, like, yeah that... I used to be an architect urban planner for Dubai, the city in the Emirate. Mm -hmm. They only had 70 kilometers of waterfront. It's all sold out to develop. So Sheikh Mohammed decided to do the Palm Islands to add, I think, 2,000 kilometers more of waterfront. Mm -hmm. And here we have God-given islands. And the country has so much potential. Like, uh, we are number one in the world in, uh, in sailors, seamen. How come right. our maritime is so lagging behind. Mm -hmm. We're now number one in the world in call centers, and and, uh, and and so many things are number one. Geothermal energy, we're number two. I think we have the third longest coastline in the world, 
longer than mainland USA. Right. Number four in gold and, uh, and ship building. Number five in all mineral resources. And number 12 in human resources. So we have natural uh, features of our country and, 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 and people are good. It's really, I think, managing and governing the country is a big challenge. Mm -hmm. And the Philippines is 400 times the size of Singapore. Uh, 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 and 350 times the size of Hong Kong, three times the size of South Korea. South Korea is the size of Mindanao, and, and, and three times South Korea, eight times Taiwan. And so there's very high development potential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, let's switch gears a little bit here because um, you have a, you had your column on Thursday and you were talking about sustainable uh, office buildings, yeah. environmentally friendly office buildings, and some examples of good ones are around the world. Um, I want to look at it from a from a larger perspective because this is this is something that I've gotten concerned about. Our climate is obviously changing, you know, and and we obviously are going to have many climate induced effects that we're going to have to live with, mm -hmm. you know, in the in the coming decades, you know. Um, you know, if not in if not in our lifetime, in our children certainly. Um, so how does how does that work? And besides individual buildings, um, which I think I think there's been a little bit of progress on that here, um, at least in the last few years, with some developers or, or thinking that way. But how did it how how does that work into like a master plan for an entire city or an entire country? You know, in terms of uh, you know, learning to live with a future where you know the sea's a little higher and the storms are a little rougher and the temperatures a little hotter. Um, how do you take what you what you talked about in your column about you know buildings that have zero footprint or very low footprint, you know, and extend that to a whole population because that's kind of what we need to do, don't you yeah. think? Yeah, I think our building codes and planning and so on uh, should uh, incentivize mm -hmm. uh, green buildings, green urbanism, and so on. Like, I think in New York, buildings are required to have rainwater harvesting. Right. To, uh, to harvest uh, and collect the water and release it outside uh, rainy seasons. I think the same in Singapore. Mm -hmm. and, and in the Philippines, we don't have the tax incentives for sustainability. Right. We have that only like when we designed the Asian Development Bank, it was tax free. So we were able to do a, a LEED certified building, ADB, in the economic zones. Mm -hmm. But outside these economic zones, there's no such incentives. And like uh, solar panels, uh, rainwater harvesting, green walls, and so on. And like, there's more flooding now than before. Like uh, Fort McKinley or Fort Bonifacio now, it has more green, greener. So rainwater percolates to the ground. Mm -hmm. But with the uh, uh, pavements and rooftops, there's more storm water now. Uh, draining in the lower areas of Metro Manila. And, and, and uh, in fact, uh, Hong Kong, it has 70% open space. Singapore, about 45%. Mm -hmm. uh, you Google yeah. Metro Manila, where are the open spaces and so on. And I had also proposed adaptive architecture because good news, the flood control drainage system for Metro Manila will be completed and bad news it will be completed in in 2035 mm. so meantime what do we do right. so through architecture engineering we do adaptation I see. let's talk a little more about that when we come back the philippines has been around for centuries malayo na rin ang narating natin but back then, the way of life has been mostly analog. Did you know that you need to take a boat from Cavite in order to go to Manila? Yes, ganon ang takbo ng buhay dati. You need to send a letter to the United States? 
Sure, pero aabutin ka ng isang buwan bago matanggap ang iyong liham. Kailangan mong tumawag sa bahay o sa iyong kaibigan? Many ways to do that. Pwede ka maghulog ng 325 sa payphone or use that vintage rotary phone na most likely 6 digits lang ang landline number. Forget about email. Telex at fax machine ang modes of communication for business. You want to listen to that one song of your favorite band on repeat? Sorry, pero kailangan mong i-rewind ang cassette tape. Buong album naman ang kailangan mong bilhin kahit iisang kanta lang ang gusto mo doon. But things change and we as a race progress. The world is getting small. We are now a traveling population. Why? Because travel is now cheap. Our friends are across the world because our form of communication is now borderless. Time zones are now meant to serve as a guide and not as a limitation. We can buy things from the comfort of our homes. Nasanay na tayo sa convenience because why not? It is the price of development and the glimpse of our future. Have you imagined the future? How do you think it will look like? Driverless cars? Yes, autonomous driving will happen. Robots replacing low-value processes done by humans? Tama ka dyan. Paying for your groceries using digital currency? Very realistic. Materials being 3D printed instead of ordering? Yes, we are indeed a progressive race. And technology plays a vital and crucial part of it. How will this affect our lives? Kailangan ba natin itong matutunan? Mahirap ba itong aralin? Or kaya naman? How can our nation take advantage of these advancements? All of these can be understood and learned. Tayo ng matuto para umunlad. Nandito na ang Abante. Progress through technology. And we're back. Now, uh, it's, it, we're talking about uh, uh, adaptable buildings. You know, we're, we're not going to have, we're, we're not going to be really protected from the climate effects that we can expect until about 2035, mainly flooding. Hmm. You know, so explain what that is. What, what can they do to, you know, to, to deal with it in the meantime, because we've got 15 years to go. Um, which is almost the lifespan of some buildings these days. Um, yes, uh, I had I spoke to a former public works secretary mm -hmm. that our drainage systems is designed only for a return of 25 years. Right. Elsewhere in the world, at least 100 years. Uh, like the big typhoons now, strong typhoons, is the it was to be 100 years. Mm -hmm. Now it's a new normal, big typhoons. At least once a year. So it, our drainage system is 75% undersized. They don't under the 100 year. And for buildings, as in the world, we were instructed by clients to design the buildings to last 40 generations of uh, uh, 1,000 years. And here, uh, I think even the tenure, leasehold of, uh, of properties here in the economic zones, it's only 50 years plus 25 years. Mm -hmm. And buildings should be designed to last at least 100 years. And, and uh, again, elsewhere in the world, even in the U.S., we have helped design the parallel codes. Like our building code is applicable or averaged out nationwide. Mm -hmm. But each locality and region has a different uh, uh, requirements, like the speed of the wind and, and earthquakes. Like Palawan should have a different uh, building code because it's not in the same earthquake zone right. as the rest of the country. But they have to follow the structural code of the whole country. Parking ratios. The parking ratios were good for the whole country. Like the same parking ratios for Tawi-Tawi and Batanes as in Makati. The same parking ratios in our building codes. How does, how does, that, yeah. how does that happen? Because that doesn't make any sense. And, and yeah. We have so many obsolete laws and regulations that make us less globally competitive mm -hmm. and keep upgrading. Like uh, Daniel Burnham, the great American architect planner, planned Manila in 1905, mm -hmm. Baguio in Chicago 1905. All the principles uh, uh, put forward by Daniel Wareham 
city efficient, city beautiful movement. After we became a republic, we threw away the principles of urban planning introduced by Daniel Burnham. And in Chicago, they keep updating it. But the same basic principles, city beautiful and city efficient. And we had that. And we also have a colonial baggage. And like we are in Tramuros. During the Spanish times, the town planning introduced here, in Tramuros, inside the walls for the wealthy and connected. Yeah, right. Extra murus outside the walls where the peasants, the Indus, and the Sanglais. Mm -hmm. You look at Metro Manila today, we no, still have the yeah. intramurus and the extramurus. Yeah, there's just little ones all yeah. over the Then over when the uh, Daniel Abraham plan was proposed in 1905, bring down those walls and create more bridges. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they're just now starting to do that in some areas. But... Um, one uh, one thing that uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you about because it's it's been it's been uh, really growing over the past couple of years although I think it's kind of tailed off a bit but the condo boom that's gone on um, is that is that is that helping at all um, you know are they or are, are they just Putting up buildings just to put them up without any reference to, to because uh, th those turn into almost like a little, a little gated community too. I mean, they, now they have shopping malls and everything underneath them. Um, you know, is that is that what kind of you know habitat that people should have in the city, or can they be doing something different? Yeah, multifamily housing or the condos mm -hmm. located in job centers are good. Mm -hmm. And I think there's even an emerging pattern now, like uh, people who reside in the suburbs are buying hole-in-the-wall units within condos near their places of work. Mm -hmm. So in that way, I think it's good. but. Uh, Location, location is very important. Right. And it helps balance off the, the imbalance between jobs and housing. And, and uh, I, they're so popular, not just for the overtime uh, in the gaming business, uh, those uh, foreigners working on that, but also for, for, for Filipinos, like uh, condominiums. And I, I wish they are more affordable closer to universities and central business districts. Mm -hmm. So location is very important. But the infrastructure need that should also be built on, like accessibility, walkability, close to transportation hubs, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, now, we, you've mentioned the water supply a couple of times. Um, what? Uh, in, in your in your planning before and in plans that you've seen, and now they're 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 planning on putting up the Kalawa Dam, which will create a new reservoir. Mm -hmm. um, is that in line with with uh, you know some of the older plans and and you know as far as the capacity for Metro Manila? Um, because it seems to me that it's still going to be short, you know, given the growth of the city. So what? You know, what do they need to do with water supply? Um, conservation, I know, would, would help. Yeah. You know, but uh, where did they get the water? Yeah, it's really, this were, all of these were put forward mm -hmm. in the 70s, uh, additional uh, sources of water. But we have surface water available, like Laguna Lake. Mm -hmm. It can be cleaned up, make it uh, 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 safer to drink. And Laguna Lake, is so huge. You can put Singapore inside Laguna Lake. Mm -hmm. If you just clean it up, and, and our rivers, if they could be rehabilitated and cleaned up, like we have, I think, 400 river systems in the country. Right. 180 of them are polluted. So we have to rehabilitate them. So we have enough uh, natural source of water and rainwater 
Elsewhere in the world, like, uh, they harvest the water, and all the rainwater goes into the oceans and the seas. We should have a system in harvesting them, collecting them. We have six months of rainy season, we have oversupply of water, and another six months of dry season, which we lack water. Right, and then we still have people lining up for hours, you know, to get mm -hmm. to get water for their homes. Another one is uh, wastewater treatment. Mm -hmm. Like uh, many progressive cities in the world, they recycle treated water. And Singapore's mm -hmm. doing that, mm -hmm. uh, Dubai is doing that, and many countries that uh, lack water. They conserve, they harvest, and recycle it. I see. Well, that's about all the time we have. Um, we could we could talk about this some more, but there's been some been some good developments in infrastructure. But as architect Paula Fox has told us, you know they're just catching up to what should have been done before, and there's a lot more to do. And hopefully they'll continue uh, because we we need it. Um, it's uh, not going to go away. The population is not going to get smaller, and there's not going to be fewer cars uh, in the future. And the climate is not going to help us much either. I'd like to thank my guest this evening, uh, architect June Palafox, and I hope we can talk about this some more as they get some more things done. Um, it's been uh, been a while since I've seen you last, and I'm glad that you could join me tonight. That's it for now. This has been Eye on Business, and I'm Ben Kritz.